Alright guys, welcome back. This is episode 178 of Match Hat, featuring the third part of my interview with Mr. David Marsh of Shadowgate fame. In this uh, episode, though, we'll be covering his FMV games, including Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective, and Dracula Unleashed. We'll also talk about Beyond Shadowgate and the Looney Tunes games. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Marsh. Let's talk a little bit more about the... Uh, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective game. I was just playing that with my wife the other day, the DVD version, which I which I thought was great. You know, I, I love the, the really tough video. to design for the DVD. The save game and the moving system is really difficult, but it was it was a real challenge. You got this uh, was released on the C platform. I'm sure almost any, <laughs> maybe Match Hat fans know about this. C T C D T V. It's even hard to say. Uh, Commodore. Uh, Commodore CD TV, DOS, Chorus Max, Sega CD, and Turbo Graphics uh, CD. Also the uh, FM Towns in Japan. Yeah, but, you know, how did this uh, Japanese connection? You know, seems to be running through all the the Icon games. In fact, really, really fun from the F, from the folks of the FM Towns actually ended up helping making uh, Sherlock a reality. Now, so, what can you tell me about this uh, Sherlock Holmes game uh, from your perspective? You talking about the new games? Or just, or the just, whole, just, the, just, the, just in general about the series, oh. and, or what you like about it. Because um, Icon was always a company that wanted to look at a new platform and said, what can we do for it that was different? And so, uh, obviously, on the Macintosh, you know, how do we take advantage of Windows? And on, um, you know, uh, for CD-ROM, you know, it was just coming out. I mean, it was like 1980. I mean, 1985 or 1984-85 is when CDs first started coming out, and CD-ROM didn't pick up, you know, really start until like 1990, I think, right? And um, and you know, uh, one of our guys was a great board game player, uh, you know, just loved playing board games. And the Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective board game was out there by Sleuth Publications, and um, and it was just a, a neat game. And we said, you know, what if we just shoot video? Uh, uh, of it, of the you know the key scenes, and uh, still have the the clue points that were involved in the game, and the newspaper, and and all those uh, the notebook, and all the, the 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 London Directory, and then just sh shoot it with video, and try to take advantage of CD-ROM because we realized we could do video. Of course, you know I don't think we we quite expected you know the fact that the video was going to run in 160 by 100 pixels, and you can kind of barely see what Holmes and Watson are doing. But it was just, it was a neat thing to try and, um, and create games for that. And the games were successful because of it, because they were new, they were on a new platform. And I always loved working on them. I was the artist on them at the time, the, the um, user interface artist. And um, I just loved, you know, everything about them. And I knew, you know, we knew right off the bat, you know, that the, you know, that the accents were going to be a little rough, you know, and, and um, you know, some parts of it were going to be, uh, you know, a, a little schmaltzy, I guess, or whatever. But we wanted to have solid gameplay, and and so when when I when I had the ability to pick up the licenses again and actually be able to show them to people who had played them and liked playing the games, and those are they're pretty much, I mean, for the most part, they're they're pretty much exact ports, other than the fact that the video is full screen now and you can actually see what's going on, and uh, just the fact that 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 um, that the original video format was still, we still had it. It was, it was in a, it was like in an Indiana Jones type warehouse and I was able to pull it off, uh, you know, of the original beta SP tapes it was just wonderful. So it was a real challenge for me. I, I knew that, you know, that there were still fans out there that really loved those games and remembered playing those games on all the platforms you talked about. And, um, to go ahead and put those out again was, was a real joy, uh, regardless of, you know whether that was a bigger audience than than Shadowgate or whatever, but it was uh, it was it was great. But uh, and so I've kept in touch with the the folks at Sleuth Times and um, and Suzanne Goldberg, Goldberg over there, who's uh, the original designer. But uh, uh, yeah, it started off as a board game and um, you know went across all these things and and it's it's pretty neat to get it out again for um, for you know tablets and for the Mac and PC. And this was right at the. I mean, this must have been one of the earliest FMV games that was. out there. I was just kind of wondering what it was, what were the expectations like at the time, and also why do you think FMV sort of fell off or fell out of a, uh, fell out of vogue? Yeah, so the expectations at the time were pretty high. I mean, we we really we spent a lot of time, a lot of energy. Remember, Icon was driven by engineers, and so. 
um, you know, we spent a, a good amount of time just trying to figure out how to get a video to play across all these devices, um, which actually is the same thing I've been dealing with on the new devices. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was, uh, our expectations were really high to go ahead and produce something that was different for, for the CD-ROM platform. And there were some other games coming out at the time. I remember Sewer Shark was coming out, um, which was kind of a shooter through kind of a, through a video. Um, I think uh, Night Trap was coming out, you know, at that time. Uh, there were a couple other other FMV um, type games that were out there, but it was really taking advantage of of uh, the medium. And so um, I think ultimately, uh, you know, the you know just. The, a new, you know, a new platform or a new type of genre just took over, and side scrollers took over. Certainly, um, first person, you know, shooters, Wolfenstein and Doom and things like that took over. And um, I just think that, you know, they were an interesting, they were an interesting game, you know, a type of gameplay. They were really still adventures in a way, you know, which is why I loved them. Uh, but why they, you know, why they kind of uh, faded off? Maybe it was high, really high production values at the time. When we had done Dracula Unleashed, we had done something different, which was take, you know, one very large movie and move, you know, and shoot scenes, you know, some, in some cases three or four different ways um, to, you know, to have multiple endings and stuff. So, um, you know, I think it was just fun, and I just think it ran its course at the time. You said something about the, you thought the accents were going to be <laughs> a challenge. Uh, I don't know much about the, the actors' uh, bios or anything. Right. Were they not right. a British, I take it? Uh, no, no, they weren't. No, so you know, uh, again, we were a small gaming company at, at that point. Icon was still small, and and so uh, you know, we we worked with actors. I think we shot the you know the all the mysteries in Minnesota. Uh, really? Oh, whoa, 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 Minnesota. That's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we actually um, there was a, a, a production studio down there. We tried to get Prince's production studio, but we weren't able to. But. Uh, you know, we shot them uh, there, and it was um, it was great fun, and we had great actors, and they were almost all theater actors, and uh, you know, we enjoyed it, and um, you know, they did a great job, and again, the story is what really drove it, but um, yeah, it would just it would have been far too expensive at the time to go ahead and make um, you know those uh, those games, uh, you know, with with you know, I guess union Hollywood union actors, it, it just wouldn't happen. I mean, for me, that's part of the charm of the game is the, right. you know, the production. I mean, and, and the fact that, I mean, the, the thing that stands out in my mind uh, from playing it the other day is the, the judge uh, that shows up at the end of the case. Right. And he just looks like he's having so much fun yeah. <laughs> telling you you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah. It must have been some great, uh, some great energy on the set. It was a lot of fun. I mean, I, I wasn't, as far as Sherlock goes... Excuse me. Um, I wasn't there uh, for a lot of that. I mean, obviously, I was on a set for Dra the Dracula Unleashed game, and um, but the you know I, I am a dead body in in Mummy's Curse. I have a knife uh, protruding out of my back, back when I had a mullet. Those are the days. Um, and uh, and there, it was just it was a lot of fun. It was so different. Nobody was doing anything like that. This whole idea of um, you know an interactive movie or something was so unusual. And to be able to do that, I mean, we had always been fans of of play your own you know choose your own adventure books and things. And um, just kind of to do something like this and to go and, and try to solve it based on watching video was, um, and then actually be able to do it was more than just being able to watch Columbo or Beretta or you know whatever on TV at that time. So. It was, uh, it was really neat. And for us, it was really different because we had been making adventure games, which we still loved. And then to kind of create something like this was um, unusual. And then after that, kind of we went into, you know, side scrollers and other things. So it was, it was far less interesting. But um, certainly, you know, working on different types of products. And then getting it to work on, on DVD was, was just, it was such a challenge that, um, that, it was again. Uh, we just loved those challenges. It was. It was great. It, so uh, I was, it was really it was, amazed playing the the DVD version because it felt like my DVD player had become a computer. Right. Yeah, and and I really and and that one uh, the limitations on on DVD were are just. I mean, just the save game system was to come up with that was. Um, it was really tough. 
And because everything is based on um, all the DVD is doing is playing every frame of the, dire the London directory or the newspaper, or whatever, is a movie being rendered out on DVD. And then, so your DVD player is constantly seeking all over the disc to see what goes, you know, what you can go to next. And so, um, again, a real challenge. But uh, I think that's always kind of defined the kind of things that I've done in my career is I've always made games that were. Um, yeah, we're kind of challenging devices, and uh, you know, we had actually worked on a game called Lands of Shadowgate for Pocket PC, and it was very close to being done. But it was called Play by Sync, and we were doing it so that you made moves and you synced your Pocket PC, and then somebody else made moves, they synced. That information went back and forth, and you saw it was a, a real uh, was not real time, but it was turn based strategy game, and you saw your moves. And now. You know, I look at where games are now and how they're syncing via Facebook and other things, and it's really, it's really cool. Um, but again, you know, in the case of some CD-ROM stuff or some of our adventures and everything, they were just kind of a little, I think, ahead of their times. Um, but um, you know, it's been a blast. Well, you mentioned Dracula Unleashed a few times. I wanted to cover that uh, briefly. Another inter interactive movie. I noticed that the screenplay on that, uh, one of the authors of the screenplay was Andrew Greenberg, who did yeah, the Vampire Andrew. the Masquerade. I mean, it's, Bill, and Bill Bridges, yeah. yeah. So what are your thoughts on that game? Well, you know, it's, it's really funny because um, it was Bram Stoker, it, it was like the some anniversary of Bram Stoker that year, and I don't remember what it was. Um, and, uh, and my boss came to me and said, I really want to make a, a vampire game. And so... Um, you know, but here's your budget, which was um, pretty small. And uh, and he said, you know, I'd love to I'd love to do this and build upon what we did with Sherlock, but make it one game. And so, you know, I was up for that challenge, and I said, let's do it. And so uh, Tony Sherman was our designer at the time, and Tony did this unbelievable job of uh, crafting the storyline over the course of four days, and uh, four game days, <clears throat> and um, and it was uh, it was just it was a blast and. And I wanted to find somebody that had written, um, you know, stuff based on vampires. And so I had actually called over to White Wolf um, and said, you know, are you guys, is there anybody there that can do freelance work and do this? And Andrew Greenberg and Bill Bridges were available. And so we would just send them the, you know, what's going to happen in the scene and they would write it. And uh, they just did a great job. Um, but we still always had the same limitations that we had with Sherlock, which is, you couldn't have a lot of movement in the video because if you had a lot of movement in the video, uh, that killed compression, and we couldn't fit it on a disc. And so, you know, you know, some of the stuff that you know things had gotten a little bit better than Sherlock, and but um, but still, we had a real challenge, which again we rose to. But uh, to go ahead and film something where you know not every pixel on the screen was changing and killing you know video compression, so. Um, it was great fun because we had shot things multiple ways and we had actually built a lot more sets and one in street. Um, and we still tried to keep some of that fun, maybe dark shadows feel to it or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it was great. The problem happened, pretty much happened at, at that time we were being bought by Viacom and they weren't very interested in that game. Um, so they allowed us to, to release it, but then did nothing with it. And I think I went off to work on a, an MTV full motion video game called Club Dead at that time, which was all shot on green screen. And that's, um, that's probably a half an hour discussion in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, well, I have a MTV. MTV's Club Dead here on my questions list. But before we get to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Beyond. What's that? I'll send you a copy of Club Dead. I think I still have it. If oh, you want. sure, I'd love to have that. I, it see, doesn't seem to be very well represented another, online. Another care package. Well, let's talk about Beyond Shadowgate, uh, which I have to admit I haven't gotten uh, to play this, even though it's Shadowgate's one of my favorite games. Apparently, this is the right. sequel to it, uh, probably because it was only on the Turbo Graphics uh, right. CD. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering why is it only available for that platform, and just what can you tell me about it? Well, Beyond Shadowgate, I mean, is is about the the original design that Carl and I worked on is about four times bigger than Shadowgate, and um, it it was it, it's a really it's a sprawling type game where it takes place right after the the original game, and then it involves a civil war between two, um, you know, two countries and how you're caught in the middle of it and everything it was really neat, but it still brought you into dungeons and things. Um, 
what happened about that time is um, we, you know, upper management had decided that we weren't going to make, um, you know, any of the more of the adventure games. So the development on, you know, programming beyond Shadowgate stopped. At the same time, NEC um, was right around the corner where we were in Chicago. And so um, we had signed a contract with them to make some games for this upcoming machine called the Turbo Graphics, which was a wonderful machine. I don't know if you've got a copy you have a Turbo Graphics around there. That's the one, flat, one, one console I don't have. <laughs> it, it was just, it was really, it had a, it was CD, obviously it was a CD game uh, machine. And uh, the best thing about it was um, it, um, it could play your audio CDs, but they didn't tout that. And then, you know, a, a CD player was like six or $700. And so, you know, it was, it was really a, a great machine. And what ended up happening was um, we, we made a contract with them uh, to, to work on games for the Turbo Graphics, and they were looking for something, and uh, somebody somewhere said, why don't you take Beyond Shadowgate and make it a side-scroller? And, um, and they did a fine job on it. That team did a fine job on it. I just really had very little to do with it. So let us never speak of it again. No, no, no. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, it was fine. And it was, again, it was a good game, and the guys that worked on it did a phenomenal job, um, but it really wasn't you know, the, the game that we had, that Carl and I had designed. So um, it went out uh, on the Turbo Graphics. We did a number of other games, uh, Shapeshifter and a couple games for some some uh, company called Camp California, which were the mascots of the, um, of the Beach Boys. And we had done some stuff before, um, you know, kind of uh, moving on to, to work on uh, uh, some of the Looney Tunes stuff. So. All right, so we wanted, I wanted to do a talk about your Looney Tunes game. And ah. Obviously, a really nice license there. Right. Uh, so what, could you, what can you tell me about these games and uh, other development? Um, you know, the cool part about them was, uh, and I don't remember exactly how we got involved with Sunsoft, which was the, the publisher of it, um, but they had come to us at some point and said, can you guys work on um, some of the Warner Brothers licenses we have? In fact, I think we were actually working on a Batman game at one point that ended up getting canceled. Um, but, uh, I, uh, you know, I had done a proposal for a, a Roadrunner based game because they wanted something that was going to be as fast as Sonic. And so we thought, well, of course, Roadrunner, you know, would be perfect and everything. But we had a very small team. Uh, I think there were only three or four of us. Um, and we had basically six or seven months to produce it. Um, so uh, we had a fantastic, um, you know, a design team, um, an animator, a guy named Jeff Troutman that was unbelievable, and Brian Babadoerity, who was uh, our background guy, and our programmer, Mike Garber. And, you know, we created um, this Roadrunner game that was a lot of fun, and uh, it did really well for, for them. And um, then we went on to, um, so that was my favorite of the three that we worked on. Uh, then we went on to work on, um, Jeff, had, Jeff Troutman had taken on um, the Bugs Bunnies, Rabbit Rampage, which was a really fun game, which is kind of a fighting game with Bugs Bunny, which was great, using all those same great gags. And so he did an awesome job on not only uh, designing and, and producing that, but doing all the illustration. And, uh, and then uh, we also did uh, Daffy Duck and the Marvin Missions, uh, which was, um, again, Brian working with a guy named Todd Papaleo to do the art animation. And, we, and Carl and I did designs and stuff. And it was just, it was so much fun working on those games. Um, and then Sunsoft basically went under, I think. So that was the that was pretty much the end of that. But we cut our teeth on those games for Super Nintendo and, and ended up doing some other um, Super Nintendo work. Like um, I did a game called Rocko's Modern Life, which was based on Nickelodeon thing. It was a lot of fun. So uh, no, it was it was again it was a, a great time to be making games at, at that time. And unfortunately, we just never had teams that were big enough to to um, you know make the epic you know side scrollers that we wanted to. Why not? Uh, the company just said, this is the number of people you get to, to make them, and this is the amount of time you get, and that's it. And in order to produce that, you just made as good of a game as you could. Probably, I mean, in hindsight, really, we should have just focused on, you know, I mean, obviously at that time I was an artist and designer, but should have really focused on one product or one product line. Um, like the McVentures would have been a great one to continue to update those, to take those to the next level. But um, we were spread pretty thin across many platforms I and mean, you had turbo graphics and super nintendo and the fmv stuff and still doing ports of some games and so 
it was just the company was supposed to spread too thin. Plus, we were doing some, um, some you know, utility work. So Timon was an example of a, uh, a, um, a debugger program for the Mac, the de facto debugger program. We were doing some stuff for, um, for Windows, just, you know, uh, Windows launching programs and things. So we were just spread too thin and ultimately, um, you know, got bought by Viacom, which was probably a saving grace. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. A lot of uh, great stuff coming up. Probably have one more slice of this interview with Dave. I want to get into uh, talking about the fall of ICOM, as well as uh, his thoughts in general about uh, the different platforms of the 80s and 90s, and uh, what he thinks about the future with all this Kickstarter stuff and the mobile platforms and everything. So uh, stay tuned for that. A lot of great stuff coming up. As always, I want to thank you if you have supported the show. If you want to do that, just go to armchairarcade.com. Look for the Match Hat link in the top right corner. Uh, donations of any size or subscriptions are always appreciated, guys. for keeping these episodes coming, so thank you very much for that. Now, what about that Ale of the Week? All right, so the Ale of the Week is a brew dog. Christmas Paradox 2012. This is apparently a special uh, Paradox, which is uh, one of their regular line of ales. Uh, I don't know exactly what's different about the Christmas version, other than it came in a cool box. Uh, this is one of uh, many ales sent to me by a fan of the show by the name of Herbert Elwood Gilliland III, who, by the way, is also a game developer. He's got a game coming out called Empire in the Sky. I'll post some links to that if you'd like to go check it out. But uh, thank you very much, Herbert. Really looking forward to trying uh, the Christmas Paradox and all of the other ales uh, that you sent me. Thank you very much. Uh, not a, there's some kind of fun text here on the bottle, but I don't really see anything about uh, how they made this or what's uh, special about it. Uh, so let's just uh, give it a give it a taste. Well, I guess I should uh, smell it first. So you know what this smells like to me. I can tell you exactly what this smells like. Um, if you have a, a wife, girlfriend, or maybe yourself, or your mom, your mom uh, but anybody who bakes cakes and things, uh, they have those little bottles of extract. Uh, the, there's one called cherry and there's one called rum. Now if you can imagine mixing those two together and smelling it, uh, that's exactly what this smells like. A lot of cherry, a lot of that rum uh, flavor. Apparently the rum extract is uh, quite strong in this. Anyway, let, let's give it a taste. Whoa! <laughs> Jesus Christ! 15% feels more like a hundred proof. Woo! Man, this is really, really <laughs> strong. That alcohol, man, just boom! Blasts you in the face. Uh, let me try to give that maybe a, a little sip this time. Uh, man, this is definitely an ale that will put hair on your chest. Uh, very strong. Uh, uh, Taste-wise, <clears throat> <laughs> okay. Taste-wise, what am I tasting here? Uh, definitely getting that rum flavor. A lot of uh, cherry flavor, uh, coffee flavor, chocolate. Kind of very sweet, sweet, uh, syrupy, and just kick your ass. Alcohol, <laughs> strong. Uh, definitely not something you want to uh, swig. Uh, you definitely want to take your time with this one. Uh, very strong. Very, very strong. As far as taste, is, as far as uh, the horns go, Jesus. <laughs> I'm gonna, okay, I'm going to give uh, one, one more little sip here. Uh, actually, uh, quite tasty. Um, like I said, it's unbelievably uh, high alcohol content. I'm sort of wondering if maybe that 15% rose somehow in transit across the pond. I don't know. Uh, but this feels like I'm just doing shots of rum. So I better, I better quit while I'm ahead. If you want something really, really strong uh, tasting anyway, uh, this is definitely a good ale to choose. If, on the other hand, you don't like the taste of alcohol, steer clear of the paradox. Uh, but I, I happen to like the taste of alcohol, uh, so I'm going to go four out of five drinking horns on this. I uh, actually really enjoy this. I'd probably only limit myself to one. 
<laughs> per week. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, very enjoyable. So thank you very much, Herbert. Uh, now what about the quotation? Now the quotation for this week, of course, is going to come from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. You probably heard it before, but I think it bears repeating. And it goes something like this. Once you've eliminated the impossible, what remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. See you guys next week. I'll have one of those. One Istanbul Express. Yes. A double. A double? Nobody orders the double, sir. Okay. Make it a triple. <laughs>